Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Mission Podcast. I'm your co-host, Joshua Montero. On my left is Corsan Wilson, and we're here to talk about week three, what we saw, what we liked, um, what we're disappointed about. As you can tell, Corsan and I are very disappointed in our teams, so <laughs> not happy about that. Um, obviously, looking forward to the week four matchup because we're going head-to-head in our support for our teams. So that should be pretty exciting. Um, but to kick us off, Corsian, how was your weekend? Oh, weekend was good. Kind of busy, as it feels like I always am right now. But uh, I don't know. I, I, right now I'm chilling. But after this, I got some more homework to do. So just on that grind, I guess. <laughs> and, yep, feeling the same way. I almost feel like I don't have enough time. I just came back from a pickleball tournament. Team didn't do so hot, but had a lot of fun. Um, definitely a sport that's growing on me for sure. So a good pastime. Um, we'll get into the games um, real quick on week three. Um, first up, Korsian, I absolutely hate you when I do this. So you know I have to bring up recapping the Broncos and the Dolphins. What happened? What happened to the Broncos? I thought their offense was doing really good. And then... We talked about their defense being an issue, but I didn't see this coming. 70 points. 70 yeah. points. <clears throat> yeah, you know what the, yeah, you know what's what's crazy about what they did with the defense this week? So, week one, and, so week one and two, Vance Joseph, his scheme is a 3-4 system. Against the Dolphins, he decides to install a 4-3 defensive front against them to try to counter them. So... He, he basically installed a new entire defense for a singular week to try to combat the Dolphins, which resulted in literally, <clears throat> I mean, like, players, it was, it was a lot of bad, a lot of players had a pretty awful game. But I think that um, a lot of players looked lost just because they completely switched to the scheme on defense for that game. I still think the Broncos lose regardless of the situation, but <clears throat> that was a big issue. Um, and then there's a few costly turnovers on the offense, which obviously didn't help the defense, like, Two Cortland Sutton uh, fumbles, and then a Russell Wilson interception obviously didn't help them. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, their defense looks pretty awful. I think that uh, the Broncos, while they didn't fire anybody, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, just to kind of save face, they keep Vance Joseph as, like, the technical, like, on paper defensive coordinator, but then they have someone within kind of be starting to take the shots uh, or calling the shots for the defense going forward. Just to kind of like at the end have maybe Vance Joseph's a scapegoat kind of thing if, you know, the season continues to suffer. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone within just starts calling the defense from here on out. But that um, Dolphins obviously look phenomenal regardless. Again, like I think they'd win regardless of how the defense played just because of how dominant they are. Um, but yeah, obviously uh, Devin A. Chain, uh, welcome to the NFL party. He had a phenomenal game. Literally 10 touchdowns on offense is pretty nice to see. I wish, I do wish that the uh, Dolphins went for the record. Like, screw the Broncos, get that record. But uh, that's kind of all I got to say. Keep in mind, they did this without Jalen Waddle. Jalen Waddle was out on concussion protocol. Um, status is still unclear for this week, whether he's going to play or not. But yeah, I mean, that's not a good look. Um, I was wondering why Chosen Anderson, that's his name now, Chosen Anderson was beating Patrick Sertan like mm-hmm. when the starters were showing the game in the fourth quarter. And I was just like, that makes a lot of sense now. Um, mm-hmm. Don't panic. The Dolphins fans, Pat Sertan is still a really, really elite cornerback. Mm-hmm. Like this is not on him. Like this is just like bad play calling. And then like, they couldn't stop the run. And I had like obsessed and like loved the Dolphins speed motion offense. If you tuned into last week's episode, um, you heard about like, how I love the schematic changes the Dolphins made um, and as well as the Patriots in that series. So go check that one out. uh, Episode 27. Um, But yeah, even without Jalen water, when you have so much of speed on the field, it doesn't matter if it's most or a chain Tyree kill. If you guys got motioned laterally, like you can open up things North and South. And you saw that like, even though like Raheem most me Raheem most is more like technically sound than AJ because like AJ is just new to this career. Mm-hmm. But like if you just go fast into the hole, like as a Dolphins runner, you're gonna get like at least 10 yards every time mm-hmm. because of the way they set that up with space in the defensive lineman, 
making sure like the lateral guys actually counted for. Um, mm-hmm. So great scheming on their part. And it's really like, it's really, you need to have good instincts and you need to like be very high IQ on defense. And even then it's going to be tough to stop this team. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to have to rely on turnovers and I'm like barring hell, this team, this team is the team to beat, I think in the AFC, even with Kansas city still being Kansas city. I think Dolphins are the rare case you can make this far in the NFL, where they're right up there. They're they're for a, they're going for a Super Bowl run, um, and I get the AFC is loaded, but they're on the top of those tier of teams that like you have to worry about. And they don't have the elite quarterbacks like that you would think of prior to the season because we we're always worried about Tua's health. But I think Tua answered all doubts past these three weeks. He's an elite quarterback. Mm-hmm. in the system and regardless yeah. like it's tailored to him so that's my thoughts on that game yeah all right we'll quickly move on save course down the misery there um <laughs> and turn to my own misery watching the bears and chiefs and long story short it's not looking good it never has been looking good this season for the bears offense Bears offense has been rough um dj moore like Hardly targeted. Like he had a good fantasy stat line for a starter. Um, if you're playing fantasy, but watching the game was a lot worse than his st- stats actually were. Um, Justin Fields like had he like made an effort to run occasionally more, but of course, on through three weeks, guess how many designed runs the Bears have called for Justin Fields? I know within two weeks they had I think it was one called one des- designed run for him. I don't know if they had any. Uh, this last week for him, though. They called just one this week, so that would make it two on the entire three games. Mm-hmm. So um, if there's one thing going for this Bears offense, it's last year they also started slow. They didn't have DJ mm-hmm. Moore. And, like, halfway through the season, they turned it around. So by some miracle, maybe that happens again. But we expected mm-hmm. this build on what they had last season mm-hmm. as Bears fans. So very disappointing. Um, defense is, like, I didn't. I didn't expect them to beat Kansas City, and when you lose like three of your starting secondary players, and then like a backup on top of that, where you're like down your three starting corners, that's you're not stopping Kansas City. I don't care if, like who they have on receiver, like you're not stopping them. Um, mm-hmm. So like it's like it's kind of like a bad time. Um, don't want to make excuses for the team though. Things can have definitely been schematically better. We had talked about how the defensive line was a weakness. Um, on the Bears team and approved itself yet again because they couldn't get to uh, Patrick Mahomes. So couldn't really lean on the defense side of the ball um, in this. It's like the way you see like other offenses open up plays for the star players seems very easy in itself. The Bears just aren't doing that. And they're sticking to like their same philosophy, not making adjustments thus far. And the through three weeks, it hasn't panned out. So I'm not going to completely, like, abandon this team at this point because I think at this point they're like, okay, something's clearly not working. And, like, the coaches are human, too. They're going to know, like, they're going to change something. At least I hope they do. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, hoping for those changes, but it sucks right now. It sucks right now. I can't, like, there's a lot of blame to be thrown, but I'm not going to go yet and say fire everybody. I think it's still way too early for that. <clears throat> yeah um i think the big thing that people expected from the bears this year was like a big step up in justin field's passing ability and that like if teams could shut him down from the run that you know with the additions of dj more with uh you know with now darnell mooney not having to be a primary target cole Komet kind of developing further in his career you know hoping chase claypool kind of pans out you know as they traded a second away for him um, so, that, you know, they added a lot of pieces around him, expecting him to be an improved passer. And like we've seen him in college be pretty good at passing. But um, at this NFL level, it still doesn't seem like he's improved in nearly enough that he needs to be as a passer. I know there's situ- circumstantial stuff and uh, like the stats don't tell everything, but he did have like 50 percent completion this week, um, which is not very ideal, especially when you're playing from behind. Like all you got to do is pass the ball and like. Like, they couldn't even get the garbage yards in the game, which um, I think is a pretty big red flag. I said before this season that I thought that Justin Fields was on the hot seat this year and that 
Um, you know, based on how the season goes, the Bears could be number one overall again, uh, you know, shooting for Caleb Williams. And, um, you know, if they don't adjust things and even if they, you know, do help them get more yardage um, from a fantasy perspective, that's fine and all. But, um, you know, last season he had crazy stats, too, but he ended up the Bears ended up with the number one pick anyway. So um, it'll be interesting to see even if they can fix the offense a little bit, how far it can actually take this team anyways. Yeah. And also. When, when your offensive line is banged up, I think there are ways you can get guys open. Um, we saw, um, I saw the Bengals Monday night. They lined up Chase all over the field. I put him in multiple spots. You could easily do that with DJ Moore. You can put him in different spots. He's a matchup player. Utilize him that way. And, like, you don't have to call screens all the time. You can call draw plays, stick routes, like, layers, layered routes where you're not having two people run to the same spot. Like you're giving predefined reads, spread the ball out, like spread, spread, spread formations, like do that to give Justin Fields more space because right now people are just spying him. They're dropping eight and they're just spying him, and like they're like immediately deterring him to run, which is causing them to hold on to the ball. And then he's overthinking. He's overthinking right now, and like to get him in the rhythm, I think the best way to do that is RPOs and read option. Just start at the very basics. Start there and then try to expand as you say, okay, the defensive line is playing this way. Oh, the linebackers are shifting this way. Like, go into concepts where if I send one guy from left to right on one play and we call it like a fake jet sweep where it's a run, if I do it again, does something open up on the left side, on that backside where the guy just left because he took a defender with it? Those are the kind of things you got to, like, you got to introduce in the game and build upon. That's what the great teams do. Mm-hmm. And I know you see that from the Bears. That there needs to be some purposeful play calls there. Mm-hmm. All righty. We'll do some rapid fire. Um, we're introducing a little bit of a new segment so we can just quickly talk about some players that have some good performances, um, what we actually make of them, um, some quick thoughts. So like one sentence, kind of one word kind of things to, to some of these, but – not limited to that, but kind of keeping it informal. So, Korsham, just going to throw out a name for you, and then just going to ask for your thoughts here. So, Keenan Allen, why was he charge? Yeah. Um, Keenan Allen, he's the guy until he's not the best player, a best receiver for the Chargers right now until, again, proven otherwise because no one else seems to be stepping up but for him. Um, And then a name for you, give you Jordan Love, Green Bay Packers. This one is nuanced. Jordan Love, like, he's running the system, how it's supposed to be run. Credit to him. Um, against the Saints, when they were down 17-0, to zero, he missed a lot of throws he should have. Like, um, but at the same time, receivers were dropping balls. He needs to play a lot better, be a little bit more consistent. But mm-hmm. average quarterback, good quarterback, he's doing a good job in the system. Yeah. All righty. Um, next name up for you. Zach Moss. Zach Moss. Um, <clears throat> looks like he's going to be the main guy, at least in terms of the running back department for the uh, Indianapolis Colts right now. But um, I still think that he's relatively inefficient as a runner. He got a bunch of carries, which leads to a lot of yards, but uh, still lacks efficiency. I think there's a lot to be uh, desired from that Colts running back room still. Um. Then I'll give you Zay Flowers, Baltimore Ravens. Wide receiver one, count on him to be the focal point of the offense. Every time Todd Munkin needs a pass play or needs somebody to separate, he's going to Zay Flowers. And that's a lot to be said because Mark Andrews used to be a trusted target of Lamar Jackson. So with the wide receiver core being banged up and having a history of banged up, um, Zay Flowers stepped up. I would not be um, – I wouldn't be too worried about his, like, Media production right now, he's going to be a breakout star. Excellent after the catch, explosive player, like best, like he has the best, like overall speed um, from like draft class. There's a lot of guys. Um, we mentioned one with A chain, but he's up there. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, that took a lot longer than I thought. No. Um, Tua Tagovailoa. Um, <clears throat> I've always said this when he's healthy, he's one of the premier quarterbacks in the league. He's showing this uh, to us continuously throughout this uh, first three weeks of the season, despite facing one historically bad defense. <clears throat> but um, 
yes, the Dolphins, they have an offensive line now that can protect him, and he's going to continue to uh, to ball out. Um, My next one, uh, I guess, what's wrong with Trevor Lawrence slash Jaguars offense? I think they out- underestimated the Texans last week. I think that's what really happened. I am not too worried uh, with this team. Um, I've always said that Bigsby and Travis Etienne had some flaws in their game, so they're not getting the right run support they need. Um, I would love to see more of Deion Johnson, but um, I'd love to see Christian Kirk more involved too because he's been producing as of late for the past two weeks, and I think him and Ridley would definitely help out Trevor Lawrence a lot more. Mm-hmm. Okay, next guy up for me, Kenneth Walker, Seattle Seahawks running back. Uh, Kenneth Walker, he, I don't know, he's proven what he showed everyone last season. He's an elite runner. Kenneth Walker is, I mean, he's the guy to have in Seattle. I think, I mean, the room in general, I think is phenomenal. Zach Charbonnet, he powered bold over a dude last week too, which is kind of crazy to see. But uh, Kenneth Walker, he's, I mean, good as advertised. You know, everybody kind of was down on him because of the Zach Charbonnet draft pick, but uh, he's proven otherwise. Um, Next for you, Joshua Dobbs, quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals. Underrated. Everybody <laughs> was writing out the Cardinals. We were writing out the Cardinals, and he just he just laid the Dallas defense. Um, I don't think he's going to go for MVP or anything <laughs> or be the best quarterback out of the NFC West. But he's making plays, man. He's making plays. He's call. Um, he's running what the coaches want. He's making smart decisions. Good quarterback play out of him. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, last one on my list. Tank Dell, wide receiver for the Texans. Yes. Um, he is part of the movement of Rise of the Short Kings. Um, you know, I think a lot of people saw his size and kind of wrote him off pretty quickly. Um. I think through preseason, we kind of saw him overcome that in the first place. But obviously, he's playing really good football. Him and Nico Collins are uh, really balling out for the Texans right now. But alongside him with the other short kings, you have like Devin A. Chain, you have uh, Josh Downs, you have Zay Flowers, um, and then Tutu Atwell, kind of this coming out of nowhere almost, putting up pretty elite numbers, which is pretty crazy to see. But yes, he's playing good. You know, got to gotta pipe up a short king. <laughs> <laughs> And then my last one for you will be Derrick Henry, Tennessee Titans. Not washed. He is not washed. Um, I've always said this about Derrick Henry. I don't think he's as good as Nick Chubb as a talent, even though his production is clearly better than Nick Chubb's. Um, it's one of those things where he ran into like his match for the Cleveland defense. I think the Cleveland defense has just been overwhelmed. We talked about it from week one. Um, where it's like how well Jim Swartz has been. Like he's probably be the MVP of that defense and the way he's utilizing players. And they figured it out. Once you once you get a hit on Derrick Henry, Henry behind the line of scrimmage, he's not going anywhere. I think you saw that. Um, and plus the usage of Taji Spears. Taji Spears is coming. They want to save Derrick Henry for the playoffs. But right now, it's kind of prioritizing. How do we get the best offensive production? So it's not all on him. Expect to see Tannehill like improve a lot. Like he's been like up and down. So not washed. Mm. All right. Um, great work. I think that's all I had for my end on the key takeaways. We're gonna jump right back mm-hmm. into a couple a couple games like I watched personally, and then like um anything that Corey Sam wanted to add. Um Sears and Raiders, Sunday night football. Um, didn't get a chance to watch most of the other games, but this one was pretty interesting to watch. Um, I thought the Raiders looked really good. Like I had Devontae on one of my teams, and he was absolutely killing, (laughs) killing the Steelers' defense. Like, he he was targeted a lot. Like, Jimmy G seemingly only wanted to go to him, but also Jacoby Myers did some great things. Like, he he looks like a solid wide receiver number two. I was was a hater of the move because I was like, I would have kept Darren Waller. and for that offense, um, but great stuff out of the Raiders like early on. But Steelers, St- Steelers like defense is for real. Like they just could not block T.J. Watt. And then on the other side, like on the Raiders defense, like 
Max Crosby was seemingly everywhere. He was just flying everywhere making plays. Like, I think it's time we talked about Max Crosby as, like, one of the top defensive ends, like, on the NFL list. Like, do you – we can talk about Nick Bosa, TJ Watt, which I just mentioned, Max Crosby, like, Miles Garrett. Like, then there's at least three other guys that I can't remember off the top of my head that should be in the, like, I don't care what order you put, like, defensive ends one through seven. Like, they should be on there, like, as as your one through seven top defensive ends. Um, I'm, I've had Najee in almost all my leagues, um, so I'm a little bit worried about him, but not because of him. I think, like, they haven't – they didn't figure out the blocking schemes until they started doing double teams with the guards and tackles. Once they started doing that, like, he and Jalen Warren were getting a lot more production, so – I want to wait and see if they continue to do that all game, like in their next few weeks. Um, but like not just kind of like a bench and then see if the situation improves for me. I'm not cutting him. Mm-hmm. I'm not trading him away. I'm just holding on to him because he is a good talent. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's about what I got for, for my little uh, previews. Mm-hmm. What have you noticed out of the Steelers and Raiders just parsing through this game? Yeah. Um, well, again, at the beginning of the season, uh, I claimed that Devontae Adams was very QB proof. And, you know, I think you had a couple questions about how his production would be uh, with, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, with question marks around him, plus the Josh Dan or Josh McDaniels system. Right. Um, but obviously he looks elite as ever, despite, you know, he's entering that kind of fall off age for receivers around that age 30 mark. But, you know, he doesn't look like he's missing a step at all. Um, and then. Uh, from the Steelers' side, uh, Matt Canada is an off- awful offensive coordinator. Um, <clears throat> like, I think I saw someone mention that it's like every time they're going to run the ball with Najee, it's like the most predictable offensive formation. Like, <clears throat> um, like he's – it's almost like every time he's in on a play, there's like a pretty high chance of running it if they're in like a speci- – like if they're like a single back formation, you know, like or some fun specific formation, um, like – Apparently they ran the ball with Najee like 90% of the time. And so defense is pretty much just keying on the run every time he's on the field. And that's where they're able to get those stops, which obviously goes back to uh, Matt Canada being one of the worst. I don't know. He's probably worse than the Bears offensive coordinator to an extent with just that's how, how easy it is, how easy it is to telegraph his plays. It just, I think it happens that the skill position players for the Steelers are got, got a slight edge on the Bears, which allows him to score a couple more points a game. But scheme-wise, I think they are a lot worse. Yeah, like, Canada is not, like, not doing good right now. Like, ideally, as a play caller, you want to have some purposeful plays. So, like, there's a reason why you're running. Like, if you're just saying, okay, I'm running this because, like, I know my team can do it. Okay, that's one thing. That's good to have, but you can't call that, like, 90% of the time. Like, when you're running a formation and 90% of the time the t- the defense knows it to run, that means you're not doing a good job like telling a story as an offensive play caller. Like that's when you go play action. That's when you go play action. And I think a lot of times like teams are not like calling play action or calling like an explosive pass plan first down. And those tend to be the bad offenses because ideally what you want to do is target your best player on first down, get yourself in a favorable situation. Because if you wait to do it on third down. Like, defenses are going to key in on that top offensive play because they want to get off the field. They're, they're going to sell out to stop that player no matter what the situation is. And waiting until then to, like, give Najee or, like, give George Pickens the ball is not ideal. So, like, there's got to be ways where move around, like, George Pickens, move around, like, Najee Harris, use them in different spots, change up the formations, run, like, bunch plays to free up guys. Like, look at what the Bengals did last week. Look at what the Rams have been doing. Like, look at what the Dolphins have been doing for crying out loud and see which players best fit that role and do those sparingly within your offense, and then the rest will follow. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be my strategy. Of course, yeah. I didn't get the call for the offensive coordinator position. Had a couple of interviews, but didn't work out. But Shame. Uh, there's, there's basically what I'm trying to say is there are a lot more ways to like run your offense and still get the mentality you want out of the team. Mm-hmm. Like, for the message you're trying to send. Yeah. Okay. Um, we will go to the Eagles and Buccaneers. Looking into this game, um, I'm not surprised by the score. The Buccaneers barely held on against the Bears. Don't forget, it was a three-point game. 
until Justin Fields followed the game plan to call a screen pass after they called the same exact screen pass <laughs> for the penalty. So if it was a three-point game against the Bears, I was like, okay, the Eagles are not going to make those mistakes. They're going to be like an actual offense um, that the Buccaneers will have to test themselves against. And it's tough. Like It's tough trying to guard A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith. Last week, Devonta Smith had a huge game. This week, it was A.J. Brown. And I love how they gave, made a concerted effort to get on the ball. Um, Goddard was used well. Swift continued to be a force. Same with Gainwell. Um, and, yeah, not much to be said. Their offensive line is ferocious. And every time it was like a third and fourth and one, you kind of knew it was just going to be that QB Neal actually sneak where it's just guys pushing Jalen Hurts, the first bad marker. Mm-hmm. So um, that's the most unstoppable play in the book. So keep running it while you're at it. Um, Buccaneers look pretty good. Like, I, I think my Mike Evans prediction turned out well. Like, he's the true number one in this offense. Not that Godwin can't put up wide receiver num- um, number one options, but, like, if it's, like, Baker's just trying to find somebody and just throw it up there, like, he trusts Mike Williams, uh, I mean, Mike Evans way more. Mike Evans way more because Mike Evans just has a huge, um, huge catch radius, and he can, like, snag balls that are inaccurate and everything like that. Whereas Chris Godwin's more of like a rhythm and timing player, like that can match up against anybody and win. But that's not Baker's style. He's just he's a gunslinger mentality. He just throws it wherever he wants. He doesn't care. Baker's played a lot better, but against that D line, it's it's tough. It's tough to be beyond them. And I'm I'm disappointed with Rashad White. I want I want Sean Tucker out there. I think Rashad White's been disappointed this season. Um he looked like he picked up some things where he got better at technical understanding, but he did not play well. There's some plays for him to make despite the line within his control, and he just did not make it. So I, w- I would put out Sean Tucker there if I were them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think – I don't know. If this is – I mean, I think we talked about earlier a while ago the uh, Buccaneers' offensive line isn't that great. And they're going against arguably like the most loaded front seven squad uh, in the league right now. So, I mean, it makes sure. sense why they struggled so much. <clears throat> um, and I mean, I don't think anyone expected the uh, Buccaneers to be winning this game against the Eagles in the first place. But right. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, like I'm, I'm thinking maybe my prediction kind, comes kind of close where they're like just barely around like that 500 mark by the end of the season where, you know, games yeah, they about the Buccaneers. <clears throat> yes, the Buccaneers. Yeah, right. where you know, games that the Buccaneers should win. Like they'll have win the handful of winnable games against poor teams, and they'll be in those. And then against you know the elite elite teams in the league, obviously, I think they do struggle a fair bit. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I think yeah, and like despite again the score and everything, uh, Baker Mayfield didn't play the worst of games. I mean, he could have played better, obviously, but it was I think just a another just average, maybe slightly below average performance. But, um, yeah, I mean, if I was a Buccaneers fan, I wouldn't necessarily panic after kind of getting beat down by, you know, the Super Bowl runner-up team. But so that, And then Jalen Carter on the Eagles, he's having, like, quietly a phenomenal rookie year right now. Um, like, I don't think, like, any news thing is really, like, any sports news has really talked about him. But honestly, like, the hype that he had pre-draft where people were questioning if like him or Will Anderson to be the number one defensive player selected is super valid. Just looking at how well he's playing right now in this Eagles defense. Um, I think it was a mistake to let him fall to the Eagles or, I mean, I know the Eagles, it was traits and whatnot, but it was just a mistake to let the Eagles draft him in the first place. But yeah, that's my thoughts for Eagles Buccaneers. Yeah. Quick note on that. Like I saw him winning a bunch of one-on-ones where like Aaron Donald would, and like chase down quarterbacks and scrambling. And if you could do that next to that font to D line, that was a great move for the Eagles. They bet big on him and he's panned out. Like absolutely. If he's in the defensive rookie of the year running, he he's probably the favorite. Um, not that Will Anderson's not doing anything like bad. He had a really good game himself against the Jaguars. But um one last thing. Um, keep it short here. Rams, Bengals. Love the way they utilized Chase in different spots and made Burrow's life much easier where he didn't have to scramble despite the calf too much. Mm-hmm. A little bit disappointed in uh, T. Higgins. Um, told you guys not to panic about Chase last week. 
is the reason why they made a concerted effort to give him the ball. Joe Mixon, stud as always. Um, but the real story is Lou Anna Rumo's defense. Like, they absolutely shut down. They're like, okay, you see Puka? He's not going off on any of us. We're shutting him down. We're, we're taking him away. Um, and, and they did that. Even Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams has been extremely disappointing. This is the second straight week where he's dropped multiple screen passes and passes in general. Um, and he's let uh, some things down in pass protection. So I have no idea what the Rams are doing at running back. But despite Kyron Williams having a successful two weeks, I don't think he's the answer on the loan. I'm going to bank on Zach Evans taking the lead role soon. Mm-hmm. It was that bad watching him drop, drop passes like that because the, if had he caught those, he would have had a much bigger night in the passing game. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, we saw what Kyron, Kyron Williams was doing last season. He was not good. Like, he, I know he had a couple of games where he led the team in, like, running back touches, but he was never really good. I mean, he's, like, he's not, like, a dynamic player in that aspect. He's not even, like, an explosive runner in the first place. I think he ran, like, a almost, like, a 4-6-40 or something like that. He was, right. He's an incredibly slow player. He doesn't have, like, you know, special uh, ball carrier vision or anything. He's not, like, in a, he was an elite at shedding tackles in college, so it's, like, He's like the most like jag type player uh, <clears throat> that you could honestly have at the running back position right now, which <clears throat> I think it's funny because you had Cam Akers who I mean he wasn't playing great necessarily either, but I think he's still certainly a step up over Kyron Williams. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but yeah, Bengals defense was really the star of the show in that game. Um, obviously, you know Sh- Puka I think only had like a couple targets all game, uh, which was you know great on them and then i think again i mean i think the rams will still be pretty decent this year especially once cooper cup comes back uh you know it's like well yeah sure you can shut down puka a rookie receiver but like once cooper cups on there it's like you got to devote all your resources to him and all of a sudden puka's getting it's gonna be a lot easy. harder <clears throat> he's gonna get all that easy one-on-one coverage or you're facing you know number two corners rather than you know the the level of talent he has to face right now but yep just a quick note um where but that's it for this episode, but on this note for Thursday night football, Kirsten, who you got winning? Lions and Packers, and what are you looking forward to see? Um, I think Lions should win this game. Um again, like I know like the Packers won last week against the Saints, but I mean there's also that Derek Carr injury that kind of derailed the Saints there. But you know, it's still impressive to see Jordan Love uh overcome, I guess, you know being down late in the game and coming back to help his team win that. But yeah, I think the lion just overall, um, just a stronger team. I think that, uh, I guess the big thing to look at is how well does the lion's defense continue to play? I mean, like against the Seahawks, they looked pretty awful. And so, uh, you know, it seems like they may be an up and pretty up and down defense. So if they can continue to get stops and, uh, turnovers, I think that lions have this pretty easily, but, um, if it's one of those days that the Lions defense decides maybe only the three of us will show up, then maybe it'll be a bit of a closer game there. But yeah, I, I still I, think that the Lions win regardless. Yeah, you said a lot of great points there. I also agree with the Lions. I think they will it'll be a close game. I think Green Bay has the talent to be in it. Um, mm-hmm. I think in the moment when the moments come, the inconsistencies of Jordan Love are gonna like derail the offense for a couple possessions that matter. And I mm-hmm. think the Lions have a really good pass rush as well. So like mm-hmm. he's actually gonna be rushed a bunch. Like I know like the like the first week wasn't that much of a challenge where you saw him at his best. And I'm like when you saw the Falcons and the Saints ramp it up a little bit, then like Pom said sweaty at that moment. Mm-hmm. So then um Jordan Love has some growing to do in that area. Um and I also think Green Bay's defense is gonna be tested. Um mm-hmm. I forgot to ask you about Sam Laporta, but oh, Sam yeah. Laporta had a great game. Like I loved him. Like, he was one of my top three tight ends coming out of this class. Super excited about him, Kincaid, and of uh, Schumacher. Um, but he's the one that's panned out. He's the one that Goff trusts, along with Amon Ross St. Brown. And then, obviously, you have Gibbs. We'll see David Montgomery's status. But there's a load of weapons where you can't concentrate on one guy um, mm-hmm. for the for the Packers. So, it's, it's on Goff. I think Goff can get it done. Mm-hmm. And... He's a, he's a lot underrated than people give credit for. And I think your prediction is back on track for Der, um, um, 
for Jared Goff there. So looking forward yeah. to it. Thank you guys for tuning in. You can follow us at Instagram at aman.a.mission. You see it in the banner there. We'll also have it in the YouTube comments as well. Let us know what you think of our quick little episode today, our predictions, our outlooks on players, and what you want to see going forward. So with that, peace out. Enjoy the rest of your week. Peace.